Hello everyone, today I will be explaining why the Virgin Mary is Mother of God and not only that but why such a term is necessary for the Virgin Mary uh, in order to have an Orthodox theology. In this video, as, as usual, we're not going to be bothering with low hanging fruit, low, low tier, low effort arguments like or accusations rather that supposedly we, we worship a mother deity or all that, all that kind of nonsense. What I want to answer is a kind of a common worry mostly Protestants have and those in the Church of the East as well, that is the Nestorian Church, that the term Mother of God for the Virgin Mary elevates her too much and it implies that she is the Mother of Divine Nature, making her some kind of quasi fourth person of the Trinity. Even if that's not the intention, it either allows for that interpretation or it straight up implies that in its theology and one of the two and in this video i will be in some of my arguments especially i'll be explaining why that's not the case and again as i said before why we should refer to the virgin mary as theotokos that is the mother of god so let's start with this video my first argument is that first of all this term is biblical yes uh, some people might ask i'm i don't remember any term regard anything like mother of god referred to mary in scripture well technically okay yes but in luke 1 39 to 43 especially the part where elizabeth was filled with the holy spirit and she spoke and said blessed uh blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb which this by the way this line is part of orthodox prayers and whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord shall come to me? So you can see the mother of my Lord. Lord is a divine title. It's a, div it's a term that picks out divine nature. It's a pick it picks out the divinity of Christ. And so there is really, conceptually speaking, in a fundamental way, really no difference between calling the Virgin Mary mother of my Lord and mother of my God. Because as I said, Lord is a divine term. As Isaiah 42, 8 shows, the name of God is Lord. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. And another thing that the Virgin Mary says in Luke 1, 48, uh, 48 uh, she says that henceforth all generations shall call her blessed. Which kind of prophesies her status in the church. So as I as I put out, hopefully, uh, the term "mother of God" is actually fundamentally a biblical term. Yes, it might have not been used in the Bible, but the idea behind it definitely is used. If referring to her as "mother of my Lord" is fine, again, you can refer if you can refer to her as the "mother of my" insert divine title, then there doesn't seem to be any problem with referring to her as "mother of God." Another argument is a very short and basic one. She's the mother of Jesus Christ, who is God. I mean, it's, it's a very simple argument. I don't think it's too controversial. Uh, if the Virgin Mary is not the mother of God, then Jesus Christ is not God. This is one of the main arguments used by many Christians against Nestorius in the 5th century. And this kind of gives you the idea that, you know, those who know basic church history are most likely aware that there was a dispute between St. Kirill of Alexandria and Nestorius Hopefully, most of those people are also aware that this dispute ended up becoming a Christological dispute. Now, a basic question will be, how come the term Mother of God end up becoming a Christological problem, right? Well, it's because this term is fundamentally, uh, in reality, Christological. That's why Teotokos is a necessary term to use. But before we get more deep into those arguments, uh, this is a possible response. I've heard this before. Where some people cite Matthew 12, 47 50, where they state that, uh, well, Christ doesn't care whether who his mother or brother or anyone is, because he says, Behold, my mother and my brothers, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father who is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. So this argument is kind of used to state, oh, well, look at Christ. Christ says that uh, he's rejecting motherhood. Basically, he's rejecting that he has a mother, and he says his followers are his real family members. Now, I want to respond to this by citing various patristic examples. You can find these in 
uh, the Katena Bible website. Uh, you can you can look. It's going to be in the description below. Especially in Matthew 20, uh, 12, 47, 50, you will find these explanations there. So that's where I'm getting these from. St. Augustine, St. John Chrysostom, and St. Ambrose pretty much state that Christ is not rejecting the Virgin Mary as his mother. And then they later on explain in what senses. St. Augustine, for example, explains that Christ is merely pointing out the superiority of being a disciple of God and following the will of God rather than being merely being related to him in one way or another, right? Being related to Christ doesn't mean you have an instant get out of jail free card, basically. That's kind of the point. And St. Augustine points out that the Virgin Mary is even more superior than she otherwise will be because she follows the will of God, right? So she follows God and she has a natural relationship with Christ. St. Theophilact of Ohrid and St. John Chrysostom state that he is, again, not denying the natural relationship, but he is emphasizing the superiority of relationship by virtue, that is, following the will of God. In other words, what he is kind of saying is that unless she does the will of God, that she bore me is of no benefit to her. Now, as we, as St. Augustine has stated, she does the will of God. I think uh, most Christians will agree that she does the will of God. And so it is to her benefit that she bore him. Uh, but again, uh, Christ is kind of warning against this, this kind of idea of partiality. There is no partiality in God. Even if you are his mother, right? If you're in the case of Jesus Christ, even if you have a mother, you don't show partiality to her unless she follows the will of God. That's what's critical and important. As Christ himself says elsewhere in scripture, um, you're supposed to even, quote, hate your parents if they are in your way uh, against God, right? If you if they're being against God, you're supposed to choose God over them. That, that's so he's kind of saying that in a different way here. Now, another argument that might be possibly made here is why not refer to her as mother of Christ instead? Now, I will be honest, back when I was, you know, not uh when I was a noob basically, this argument kind of convinced me at first. Uh, it 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 made a it made it made sense to me, right? It's like it's kind of a simple argument. I mean, referring to her as mother of God can be confusing. It might lead to errors, right? Uh, if understood in a wrong way, you know. Okay, we understand what you mean. We we know that you don't mean bad. You don't you don't mean evil. Okay, we get that. But it can have that interpretation. So why don't we just play it safe? and refer to her as mother of Christ, because she is the mother of Christ, right? She is the mother of Christ. It seems like a very, very innocent argument. As a matter of fact, it is not an innocent argument. Now, the term Christotokos isn't by itself incorrect, but if it is used in rejection of the term Theotokos, that is what makes this term very, very dangerous, because one of the problems with the term Christotokos, especially when you look at history, is that for Nestorius, what Christ meant to him was completely different to how we understood as Christ. Because for him, Christ is kind of this name that unites two distinct uh, separate natures. The main problem behind this is that this really denies a real union between the human and divine natures in Christ. Um, and an example that I, I want to give as, a, as an illustration is that in Protestant soteriology, one of the main points of it is that God was crucified on the cross and died for our sins, right? Uh, now, of course, the, the way we look at atonement and the way they look at atonement is different in many ways, although I will say that we don't deny that he was a bloodless sacrifice. We don't deny that. Uh, he died for our sins. Uh, you know, the, the, these are all biblical, but... You know that that's a different topic, but it's kind of interesting to hear Protestants, the Protestant soteriology being based on God being crucified on the cross, and then at the same time saying you can't refer to the Virgin Mother as Mother of God. Well, actually, the principle behind saying that is the same thing. Again, they will also say that God wasn't crucified in His divine nature, but God was still crucified, and. 
the principle behind this is exchange of properties. That is, in, in a short way, in a very simple way, I, I go more in depth on this in many of my videos, most recently in my video on the Tome of Leo. But in a short way, refusing to use the names interchangeably kind of denies the, the real participation of the human nature with the divine nature and the real union of, of, of both of them. The, the union of the two natures is so personal, is so strong, that there is a exchange of attributes uh, between the two natures. And in short, this kind of means that the human attributes are now divine attributes, and divine attributes are human attributes in the person of Christ. Now, if you're not saying that this means that the human nature lost its, lost its natural characteristic, this is an argument St. Maximus the Confessor rejects, but rather that the energies of both natures uh, interpenetrate each other and are in a strong communion. The point of this is simply this. When we say Mother of God, we're not saying that she was the Mother of Christ's divine nature. That's obviously impossible. She was the cause with the Holy Spirit of his human nature, which gave him the second birth. But the person she gave birth to is God. And not only that, the, the, the natures in Christ were so strongly united with each other that they are in a communion. Now, if we reject the idea that, these, that human uh, nature and the, 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 this kind of union, then we kind of lead to a conjunction where the two natures aren't really united. They're only united in terms of will. And, and so one of the arguments that can be used is here, that's kind of an historian argument, is that only you can only use human terms for human nature and divine terms for divine nature. You can't uh, use them interchangeably in the case of Christ. That's, that's not the case. But... Again, that's, an, that's a fundamental and historian argument because it denies a real union of the two natures. Now, we don't say that the natures were confused in Christ. That's another point. But there was mingling, in a sense. St. Gregory, the theologian, uses this term that the two natures mingled. They didn't mingle in their natural characteristics, as St. Maximus the Confessor points out here. Uh, he says, according to the exchange, the natural attributes of the two parts of Christ, that are, that are the two natures, are exchanged according to the ineffable union without a change or mixture of the natural principles, that is, what the natures themselves are. And in, in, in other words, the human nature of Christ was truly deified, and this truly deifies our nature as well. But this also means that we can properly speak of Christ in a, in a sense that God walked on earth. That's why we can call, God, call Christ Emmanuel. God with us, right? God, or that God is among us. Haha, <laughs> among us, ha, oh, yeah, funny jokes, right? Yeah, people are going to, it's probably going to be people making that joke, but uh, th this is the reason why we can kind of speak of human nature be being deified. And this is why it's fundamentally important to refer to the Virgin Mother as the Mother of God, because not only does it affirm a that Christ is God, but it affirms a true union of the two natures, unlike the Nestorian idea, where the two natures are not hypostatically united, they're only merely united in conjunction, they just act in accordance with each other, and therefore they and therefore divine names are only proper to divine nature, human names are only proper to human nature. If you don't believe me, if you think that I'm making this argument up, read read Nestorius. You can literally read what Nestorius says in Bazaar of Heraclides. You can read what Nestorius says. Uh, you can read his quotations from St. Kirillin against Nestorius. You can read the, the Acts of the First Council of Ephesus. They have been translated. These are arguments that he makes. And many, many Protestants make this argument too. But this argument leads to Christ being two persons. right? And so referring to her as Mother of Christ, again, refers to uh, pretty much implies that there are two distinct persons. This is another reason, the kind of a more in-depth reason, and I think you will definitely understand, especially if you read Farj and Makak and St. Kirill of Alexandria and the Christological Controversy, when you kind of understand the principles that St. Kirill is talking about in terms of Christ, it will become even more evident why this term is very necessary uh, to have correct theology. 
And so these are the main reasons why we refer to the Virgin Mary as Mother of God. If you like this video and if you learned something new, make, just click that like button. Subscribe if you haven't. Uh, share it with your friends if they need to see this video and learn something new. And I will see all of you in the next video to come. Thank you for watching. May God be with you all.